every so often I'll hear someone talking about the year of the Linux desktop. And at this point, we all acknowledge that the year of the Linux desktop is just a meme and not something that's ever actually going to happen, but it's certainly fun to joke about unless you are new to Linux and you don't realize it's a meme just yet and actually take it seriously. So this guy, I wanted to show you the post on Reddit, but Reddit mods don't like fun, so they deleted it. Luckily, I have an RSS feed though, so I still have a copy. This guy talked about things like how the Steam Deck is coming out, how NVIDIA is showing off ray tracing on Linux, how you've got groups like Linus Tech Tips and a bunch of other media outlets putting a lot of eyes onto Linux desktop. And if you then go and combine this with things like how Chrome OS is really, really popular and the fact that if you're running Windows, there is an official built-in way to have a Linux VM to run Linux applications under Windows, all of this stuff makes it really seem like this is the year of the Linux desktop or next year is the year of the Linux desktop. But the thing with the year of the Linux desktop is this bar will forever be moved until Linux is basically the only operating system that exists. And even then, that probably isn't going to be enough because it's not going to be the right kind of Linux. You probably have to be using like this specific distro, otherwise we haven't actually got the year of Linux desktop yet. Now that was just me overanalyzing a meme about a future that I don't really ever see happening. What I want to talk about today though was a different future. A future that I don't think is a good future or anyone really should ever want, but I think is the future that we are actually heading towards. I like to call this future the year of the web desktop. And if you know where I'm going with this, you probably see the same thing that I'm getting at. If you don't, however, stick around for a bit and hopefully you'll understand what I'm trying to get at here and why this would be such a bad thing to happen. So most normies don't care about their operating system. In fact, a lot of people simply don't even know what they are actually running. If you ask someone what their OS is, they're probably going to say Windows. They may not actually realize if it's like Windows 8, Windows 10, or Windows 11 if you're watching this a little bit in the future. And even in the cases of things like Windows 7, I know people today who are running Windows 7 and using it as if there is no problem whatsoever. That OS is no longer getting security patches and you should not be running it anymore. At least running in any capacity where you're connecting to the internet. I guess if it's like an air gap system, let's say it's like, I don't know, an offline gaming PC or something. I don't know, whatever use you would have for Windows 7, that's fine. That's not an issue. But like, don't do your banking on it. That's just a bad idea. But the computer still works. So why not keep using it? And they didn't realize they could ever update it. So they just kept doing what they were doing. At the end of the day, if you don't care about computers, you don't care about tech, a computer is just a tool to get work done. I don't care about my car. It's a tool to get me from point A to point B. I understand there are people who like really care about like modifying the car and all that, but that's just not what I care about. And in the same vein, most people don't really care about native software either. If the software does everything they need it to do and gets out of their way, that's really all that matters. In fact, not having to install something and just being able to run it inside of your web browser might actually be better because that's way, way more convenient. You don't have to go and update it yourself. It's just always there and always working. At least that's what it seems like. As long as the internet doesn't go down and the website doesn't go down, it's just always there to use. But when you're running something like Outlook or Gmail or any of the, it's called G Suite, the like the Google document suite, or you're running say the online Microsoft Office or Discord or anything like this, because they're from such big companies, it doesn't seem like it ever really would go down. So you get most, if not all of the features, you get always updated software, and it's just there at the click of a button. And it's all inside of this web browser where you have tabs and all of this stuff that you're already working on for other things that you are doing. Wow, this seems so great and so convenient. And then we go and combine this with another thing. Subscription models have been really, really adapted to. Everyone just seems to accept the fact that a lot of software now, you just pay a monthly fee and you just have to keep paying that until the end of time. 
I think the reason why people are so accepting of this is because it basically hides away the cost. What I mean by this is you no longer have to pay a massive upfront fee to buy the software and then own it forever. Install it on as many systems you want, do whatever you want with it. Now, instead of paying, let's say, I don't know, $200 for, I don't know, the the document editor software, let's call it that. Now, it might be, say, $10 a month. And even though you're going to keep this software around for five years, where it's instead going to cost you $500 rather than the upfront $200, because you're paying much smaller increments, it's much easier for people to afford if they don't have that massive upfront cost. Now, what if I said to you that you didn't need a powerful computer to do any sort of intensive computing? You might say to me, that sounds ridiculous. How are you going to do that? Well, let me introduce to you hybrid personal computing, also known as Windows 365 Cloud PC. Now, this is not the first time this has been done, but Microsoft is offering this themselves. Basically, what this is, is Microsoft is going to rent out a Windows VM and you can then go and connect to that and do all of your computing on that system rather than on your own. So basically, you could have a very low-powered device and still do things like video rendering because all of that is happening on a separate system. Now, this is a very general use case. If you want to do things like, I don't know, your taxes or some programming or video editing or anything you can do on Windows this is what you would want to use it for, but it's not the most optimal thing for doing things where latency is very important. Things like, say, gaming. In that case, you might want to use something more specialized, like, say, GeForce Now, where you can just connect to this with, like, a really low power system and play whatever AAA games or even Fortnite if you want to, and it just, it just works. Sure, it's not going to be the best experience you could possibly get. I could go and sell a liver and then buy a 3090 and have a much better gaming experience. But for a couple of dollars a month, this does seem very compelling. So if we take all of this stuff together, this takes us to my idea of the model for the future. And I don't think this is going to be a future that most people really fight against. It's going to be easy. It's going to be convenient. So just lay down and accept it, I guess. With the exception of very specialized software, things like gaming, where right now doing that inside of a web browser, at least natively, is incredibly difficult. It's getting very, very easy to do basically all your work inside of a web browser. Whether that's things like checking your emails, doing taxes, writing documents, doing spreadsheets, even if you're a programmer, there are web-based IDEs you can use that are basically as good as the desktop variants. And this leads to a bit of a problem then. Let's say a company wants a desktop app because sometimes it is more convenient to just better click a button on your desktop and the application just opens up. Well, what if most of the dev team is JavaScript developers and we don't really want to train those people into something else and rewriting the app in another language is expensive and time consuming? What if instead of doing that, we don't make a native app? What if instead we take the web application and make it a desktop app. And this is where you see the rise of Electron applications. Electron is basically a stripped down version of Chromium that really only has what you need there to actually get a page to render. So what this allows you to do is take your website, stick it in this thing, package it up so it looks like a desktop app, but not have to do really any extra work to make it a desktop app. This is really cheap, this is really convenient, and companies are really starting to like this. Things like Discord, for example, don't actually have a native application, it's just a packaged version of the web app. Or how about you take the free version of the Microsoft Office Suite that gets packaged with Windows? That is also just the web app version, just on your desktop. There's nothing else special about it. But not every piece of software is going to be free. Sometimes a company doesn't want to sell your data. They want to sell your data and also get subscription fees. So, hey, everyone's just accepted that subscription fees are fine. So what if we were to go and add subscription fees to these desktop web apps? 
people will just accept it. It's perfectly fine. And because we're using web apps, there's no reason to save stuff locally. So you could go and save everything in the magical cloud. And you could go and use the desktop web app and have the exact same data as you have in the regular web app. But sometimes maybe you're going to need a more powerful computer. So how about we go and rent a VM in the cloud? And because everything you're doing is already in web apps, all your data is already magically here. Wow, this is so convenient. And because most of what you do on a computer isn't really that intensive, you don't really need that powerful of hardware, so you might as well get something really cheap. Let's say like a Chromebook and spend a couple hundred dollars. And then if you need to do something more intensive, let's say some video rendering or some gaming or anything like that, that can all just be done in the magical cloud. Pay a small subscription fee and you're good to go. I think this is very, very far into the future, but I think this is going to lead to, I guess, big companies phasing out actual desktop software. Now, obviously, there will always be developers who have powerful systems who are actually making proper desktop software. That, I don't think, is ever going to go away. If the hardware is for sale, someone is going to buy it. But I think for the regular consumer... Having a powerful computer just simply will not matter in the future. And once that happens, once you've got basically no control of your system because everything's being done in your browser and everything's being done somewhere in the cloud and you don't have any of your own personal data stored locally on your system, it's all stored somewhere online because that just makes it more convenient. Not saying having a backup is a bad thing, but you should have a local copy somewhere, preferably backing up somewhere that you own as well. Once that happens, I don't think there's any way you can really get back from that, and any told number of things can be done with that data. There will be data leaks, and they will be bad. I know this is a very dystopian look at the future, but I think it's very important to have an understanding about where we can go if we don't stop the trends that are currently happening. I think there's still plenty of time to make sure this doesn't happen by encouraging people to care about things like privacy and care about their data. This can be stopped, but it won't be stopped if you don't try to stop it. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you like this video and you'd like to support the channel, become one of these amazing people over here, please do go check out my Patreon, subscribe to LibrePay, all linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea, where I barely talk about tech, but there will be some tea sometimes. Uh, it's available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays, where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or so YouTube shorts, and this channel is available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.